suitors and supplicants. Gas up your feline slick back. Blind onlookers with your sunny torque. And yes, you can borrow my cloak, but you have to dry clean it this time. Do you know how long it takes to get giant's blood out of falcon feathers? I apologized so many times. And it's time to talk tall to me. Welcome back, I am Omen Thomas Sade. And I am Nick McGill. Together we are feckless momes. And this, my furry babies, is Talk Tall to Me. An after-battle twitcher party in the heavenly fields of Prog Rock, in which natal down Nick and over-brooding Omen will take turns but incubating every single track that sexually dimorphic rock band Jethro Tull have ever evacuated from their cloective, from their collective cloaca. I like cloactive. <laughs> we will catch claw chords emanating from the Joe Parrish perch. We will hark to the reverberating sounds of Scott Hammond's hellacious hallux. And we will gaze in amazement at the flexibility and suppleness of David Goodyear's gape flange. And finally, we will ogle the open-keyed octogenarian Ian Anderson as he conjures phantasms, both feathered and foul, to prove once and for all that one Ian in the hand really is better than two in your bush. You kind of changed it up a little bit. You, you threw the Ian in very at the, at the very beginning. I like it. it. Kept me on my toes. Kept all of our listeners on their toes, too, I'm sure. Kept you on your claws. That's right. My dainty little claws. I discovered that the width and breadth of bird terminology and birder terminology is it's horrifying. <laughs> it's chasmus. Yes. Yeah. I fell into the chasm. <laughs> yeah. The the birder chasm. The bird chasm. Nick, speaking of birds, tweet tweet, what do we see in our binoculars this very evening? Well, we are going to be looking at some feathers for sure. We are looking at the fourth track off of this brand new album. We are now officially, last week we were a quarter of the way. This week we're a third of the way because math. Wow. Good on you. (laughs) Let me fill up my drinking horn and let's have a listen to The Feathered Consort. Yes, indeed. Let us. Nick, there we have the feathered consort. Woo. Woo indeed. I give that to, I feel a woo coming on, cuz. Here it come. Woo. That's a reference to a Kanye West song, and you are welcome. We're not allowed to reference that person on this podcast. It was before he went entirely crazy. It was in the periods, in the brief period of time when he made some good music. I bet he was still an asshole underneath. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> Goodness me, Feathered Consort, Omen. First thoughts, this song following All Father, our poppy little jingle. Uh, what do you think? I feel like Ian is really regrounding us in the prog, more the, the traditional prog, the more what we're used to sound. Mm-hmm. Coming from All Father, which was the the pop hit of the decade, dropping into Feathered Concert, I feel like it is more what we would expect rhythmically and in terms of tonality and, and melody. Mm-hmm. That being said, the question is, is it successful? Where does it really take us? Where do we find ourselves with this song? And I am not sure about that. I think it's a stepping stone to get back into the heavier stuff. I think we we had Veluspo, which was like a a nice little appetizer, straight into Ganunga Gap, which is a beefcake. Yes. Then All Father, like bop into the pop, and then Feathered Consort is kind of the gradual step out of that pool of pop to then jump into Hammer on Hammer. Yes, it's serving us mystery, 
it's serving us fantasy. It is a little bit capricious, may I say? You mm, did you fill out the form? I filled out one of the forms. I'm not sure. Listen, don't it's, tell my uh, lawyer that I said capricious. It needs to be in duplicate. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be our little secret. <laughs> yeah, capricious is actually a, v- a very good good way to put it. This is more. If last week was like pop with a tall pop crammed into a tall shape, this is tall with like a little flavor of pop. It's less intense pop wise than it was. So we're starting to get more into that variety and that feel of, oh, wait, this is tall. There's something very appropriate about the musical format and the the structure of this song Hmm. because Freya is the goddess of so many different things. And depending on which story you read, she seems to have one personality or another. She's very, I think, hard to pin down in some ways. Mm -hmm. And the structure of this song is the same way. It starts out with that beautiful flute intro that is accompanied, I believe, by Ian's guitar. Beep, 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 bam, 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 with Joe Parrish coming in there. We have a lot of syncopation. The time signature needs to be sent off to Harvard for the quantum <laughs> mathematicians to solve. To figure that out, yeah. Yeah, there's a there's some sort of a formula that they have over there. In there with their book learning. Right, they've got supercomputers that can handle that kind of stuff. They can. Yeah. We might have an aneurysm if we tried to figure it out. I, I right. did try to figure it out. The best that I could come up with, the best that I could come up with is that it's mostly in 12.8. Which I'm not sure is a real time signature. <laughs> I thought that I thought I heard. Are you talking about like just the beginning, just this intro, or or the entirety of the song? Well, some of it's definitely in three four. I caught some three four and four four. I thought, but I'm definitely more of a, an amateur than you are. I've been practicing my counting on Nickel Creek and Dave Brubeck. So I'm so proud of you. That's great. Yeah, I jumped oh. right into the deep end on those. So. Well, because everything else is just going to be counting to four over and over again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even though a lot of those are 4-4, four, four, like, is it, what's the appeal of 4-4? Four, four? Like, is, it, is there something like anthropologically, mathematically that it's appealing to our ears? Yeah. It's easy to dance to. Oh. But other cultures are like 3-4 is their standard, right? Like, aren't there other, like... I thought there were some that, like, they just, their default is a different time signature. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. I don't know. 4-4 four, four is very, it's so steady that it's very mm-hmm. easy to get into. Bum, bum, okay. bum, 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 bum. You don't have to think very hard. It's easy to get into it. Yeah. For Westerners, I will admit my lack of knowledge on the time signature preferences of other cultures. If you ever really want to blow your mind, you should check out the gamelan music of Bali. Yes, I think you mentioned this a long time ago. That music is representative of the, all the different cyclical patterns of the agricultural system that they have, which is extremely complex. Wow. And so they have lots of overlapping, you know, like, I forget who was telling us, but, you know, you can have a 20 beat measure and a four beat fray. You can have a 20 beat measure and a four beat fray. You can have different numbers and they will eventually link back up. They will seem to go apart and then they'll link back up. And Tull does that a lot. Gamelon does that yeah. as well. But there are like four or five different rhythms that are happening that only link up in certain places. And some of them will link up here and some of them will link up here and they all only link up once in a while. I think that was J Mancillo. I think. I believe you are correct. Yeah. I believe J Mancillo was he. Who did the mentioning? (laughs) 
Yeah, wacky time signatures, obviously, to be expected. I think on initial listen to this album, and by initial, I mean the first like two dozen times, initial listen, and that's only 15% joke. So the initial like two dozen times you listen to this, for me personally, a lot of this album kind of sounded muddy and kind of sounded the same, and it didn't really, each piece didn't really stick out in terms of uniqueness from the whole story, the whole Sonic story. Uh Uh-huh, until you started getting into it a bit more. That's it, yeah, exactly. Like, this song was was a little boring to me until, like, I sat down and really picked it apart. I think I need to listen to this song 15 or 17 more times, because when I listen to it, I am, I think, a little bit still in that phase of, okay, wow, amazing, you have this section, really cool, you have this section. All of that is really great. What I am so far lacking from the listening experience is that sense of flow of like, oh yeah, it's all it's all designed for this greater experience. I, I'm still getting yeah. caught up a little bit in that beautiful first section. And then we go to the bum 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 dum ba dum ba da dum that section, which is so pretty. Then at around 145, we go into kind of a march. Yeah, that breakdown. Oh, it's so good. Love that part. Following on that, we have this more proggy, I wrote something V squarts, and I don't know what that is. <laughs> it is it is V squarts, I, I do have to say. <laughs> I don't, I'm really not sure what that could refer to. And then we get into the three, four section when we come into the last two verses. Yeah, that's the present day portion. Ian's gloss on the subject. Yeah, every single set of the lyrics, I didn't realize it before, the first three stanzas are that white. So those are the historical. The last two are the pink. So it's the Ian reference. So he built every one of these songs identically in terms of iambic pentameter, tetrameter, whatever he did. Structure-wise, every song is this way. And they sound so different. Yeah, it's like they said back in college, two in the pink, three in the historical. We went to two very different colleges. (laughs) (laughs) We put four in the historical. (laughs) Yeah, that Ian part where it gets, so that the three, four part where it gets so flowy and, and kind of dark. I love that sound. I love how he did that. It's very, very sweet sounding to me that might be my favorite section of this song yeah let's maybe let's let me just have another quick listen to that Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. What? To- <laughs> <laughs> it's just silly. It's just silliness at that point. I really don't know what's going on. Could that not have been four, four? One, two, three, four. 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 Not really, because this where the phrase starts doesn't fall on the beginning of a measure. Mm, okay. It would be a really c- crazy way of counting it, but. I mean, maybe. Thoughts on Mr. Joe Parrish in this song? Funny you should ask that. He's very subdued in this one, I think. He he steps forward and we hear him. And hearing it, hearing his subduedness so prominently in this song, how notably subdued he is. Okay. And that makes when he does step forward in that spotlight much more effective. <laughs> 
But it made me realize that I feel like it was the exact same way in All Father as well. Like he's he is playing a lot in the back here. Here being this album. I think that what what my observation is with this song, as opposed to the other couple of songs we've heard so far, is that in the other songs, you're right, he's mostly playing just a very, you know, solid supporting role. But there are times when he comes out and Ian has been like, All right, yeah. Joe, here's your here's your moment to rip. And he comes out and rips and it's great. Yeah. In this song, we don't really have a featuring Joe Parrish moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems slightly tense somehow, slightly not like not relaxed into it. Like, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Much more prominent are the drums in this song. Drums are very nice and splashy. Very. The synth is too. Got a lot of d different variety on the synth. I like the synth a lot. They raise her up to Is the synth on string setting here, or am I hearing actual strings in this? I didn't hear any strings, but that does not mean that they're no. that they're not there. I th probably think it's the synth. What I heard was the synth, and what I love about the synth setting in this is that my interpretation was there was no attempt to disguise it as a synth. It's just, it sounds electric. It sounds nostalgic for that reason. I don't know. There's something nice about it. But nothing too, like, corny nostalgic. Like, it's a very nice sounding synth. It's very, very pleasant to hear. It is. Yeah, it's, and it doesn't, nothing really comes to the forefront on this song. Again, synth and drums are the ones that I hear the most out of, other than Ian's flute, obviously. But that, that really makes me think that this, this iteration of the band really does, well, I guess the last one did too, I'm just subbing out Joe Parrish James, is really an, an ensemble piece to accompany Ian. And it really feels that way. Yes. I want to put a thought into your brain. Oh, God. And then we can think about it during the act break, and then we can discuss it during the second half of the show. Are you ready? I will allow it, but what thought do I have to remove to make space for that? <laughs> um, uh, anything <laughs> from your past. <laughs> I, there's a okay. lot in there that I think you don't need. Yeah. Yeah, I could think of a couple of things in high school, many things in college. Yes. Take one off the top. Okay. Beautiful. My thought is this. It occurred to me when Ian first started playing his flute in this, that there is something, there is something about the nature of this album, about the music of this album that feels very at the service of. You were just commenting on how the band as a whole feels like they are really there to support and accompany Ian. Mm -hmm. And then Ian starts playing at the very top. And I thought to myself, wow, this really feels as opposed to some of the earlier albums where it was like Ian expressing his inner turmoil, being like, I have so many artistic thoughts and I'm an artist, so I got to express them. Yeah. Mm. I'm the pied mother <laughs> piper and I'm going to take you down <laughs> to rat town. <laughs> <laughs> this feels like he is at the service of Freya, the goddess. Mm. And it, a thought occurred to me, does this count does him playing this music count as sacrifices to these gods? Interesting. And by extension, does our listening to these tracks count as us sacrificing our ear listening space, the meat of our ear sheep, <laughs> to these Norse gods? You got to get your ears checked out pronto. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very ill man. I want you to think about it, and we'll talk about it, but that's that's my thought. Okay. I want you to know that I, I forgot my mother's maiden name for that. <laughs> and <laughs> now I won't be able to answer any of my security questions. <laughs> oh, boy. Welcome back to the halfway point of our show. I can't believe we've made it this far. Nick, have you got anything to discuss here in this liminal space? Nothing album-wise, nothing news-wise, nothing 
review-wise. Okay. I do have a, a tiny little anecdote that we can throw out. Regale us. This past weekend, Saturday, it is Saturday, it's pretty early in the in the morning. Rook has climbed into our bed with a stuffed animal and we're talking. I get up and go do, I, I start doing chores outside. I come back in, not shortly after, I think I like started the sprinkler. I come back in and I hear, I hear Gnunga Gap playing. Okay. In the bedroom with Raven and Rook. And I was like, is this just... This is Jethro Tull. This is rock flute. And Raven's Am like... Am I being pranked? Yeah. He, Raven's like, yeah. With with utter like disgrace and disdain. She's like, yeah, he wanted to do a dance party to it. <laughs> and he was he was in her jewelry box gra- putting on all of her rings and like dancing to it. <laughs> oh, wow. Yep. That's my boy. I don't know what's funnier. That that's what he wanted to dance to? Or the concept of someone dancing to the song Ganunga Gap. I know, right? It was the whole album. I mean, All, uh, All Father came on after it. So, like, I, I don't know if they requested rock flute. I don't know what, because he knows he knows a lot of the albums, at least just by name, if not some of the songs. So, it's, so it's hard to know how it got there. I can't wait for the rock flute Kids Bop album. Oh, God, Kids Bop. Ugh. A lot of kids singing in unison is terrifying. And then you put it over a pop song. No, thank you. I'll pass. No. Well, yeah. good for him for good living for me. his good for you. <laughs> good for everyone. <laughs> yes. He's, he's clearly living his, his best life. And Raven supports that as much as she hates it. That's the role of a parent. This. Yeah. That's what it feels like. What you're into disgusts me. How much money do you need for it? <laughs> What I'm into disgusts me. I can't believe I spent that much money on it. (laughs) Yeah. Daddy needs a new pair of trousers. Nick, welcome back. It is now the second portion of our podcast here, talking about the Feathered Consort. That it is. That it is. Let's dive in. I'm sorry, do we want to address the, the thought that you put into my head? Yes. I forgot about that thought. We can gloss over it if you want. That's fine. No, 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 no. Thank you for reminding me about that thought. Yes, I would like to know what you think. Does music count as a sacrifice to a god? I think at this point in Norse mythology, they'll take anything they can get. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So, So, yeah, I suppose it could work. I think in their heyday, they probably wouldn't have rook so paltry on offering. It would have been the sauce to the meal instead of the meal itself. Certainly, yes. If that, if they would even accept it. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if the retelling, you know, the oral tradition of telling the myths, if the runes themselves are considered magical and therefore the writing form is is considered magical. Hmm. I wonder if there is a, if by telling stories of the gods that you are in a sense invoking them, or if it's more similar to the Christian idea of make a joyful noise unto the Lord, praise him through song and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Back when God went vegan and stopped accepting blood offerings. Right. That was his New Testament phase. Yeah. Yeah. God moved to LA and was like, I'm intolerant (laughs) to gluten. I'm a, I'm a vegan. I'm vegan. I thought you were going to ask if Ian was somehow possessed by these gods in the production of each of these songs. Enthused, if you will. He wishes. Yeah, right. He is the avatar. He is at least trying to be the avatar. It doesn't feel that way. I don't know. There is something very... I think any kind of performance, there's t- there's kind of two ways of doing it. There's the way of saying, I'm so freaking amazing and powerful, I'm going to blast the audience with this performance of mine. And there's another, which is to kind of step aside and ride the performance as a an observer. Mm-hmm. And it's it's easier if you believe in some sort of outside thing to step aside. Mm-hmm. That certainly feels more apt in this instance here. You know, Ian is... He's kind of stepping in, into his Homeric phase, 
where he's he's simply the mouthpiece for this greater story. Mm-hmm. Speaking of this greatest story, let's talk about the feathered consort. To whom are we referring, Nick? Yes, let's go straight to the little, the tiny little blurb that that Ian put in front of the album. It's uh, the song itself, rather. The feathered consort refers to Frigg, Odin's wife. Marriage, motherhood, falcon feathers, weaver, appears to be identical to Freya. Mm-hmm. That's all he put in there. So we're looking at, at both Frigg and Freya here in terms of Norse mythology. Yes. That is something that comes up a lot in the research, in the small amount of research that I've done, is that sometimes they are referred to separately and sometimes they're referred to together. And there's a lot of overlap and a lot of kind of bleeding of one into the other. In some yeah. versions, Odin is not her husband. Her husband is called Odur. Mm. O-D-I-R, right? O with a funny hat, D with a funny thingy, and then R, yeah. Oh, oh, that, okay, yeah. Odur, yeah, that sounds right. You kind of wonder if it's like an Old Testament, New Testament, or Old Eda, New Eda kind of thing. Like, is it kind of a... A conglomerate, like it's it's the working copy and then it's the final piece that they kind of got combined, maybe? You know what I think is probably more similar to? Because these myths are so old and went through various translations and kind of skipped cultures, mm -hmm. skipped across various cultures. I think it's probably similar to the Greek gods versus the Roman gods. Mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. same basic principles are there, but some of the names changed, some of the relationships got switched around because there were, you know, a thousand years separating them. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds likely. Yeah. So Freya is, or Frigg, in Old Norse, one of, the, one of those names means the lady, mm -hmm. and she is the goddess of love, beauty, fertility, sex, war, gold, and siedr which is the magic of observing and influencing the future. Yeah. So she's, she's taking the spot of, she's kind of, she's a Hera, Aphrodite, Athena kind of mix here. Yeah. She's the Norse it girl. She's the all mother. She's every woman. If I knew the next line, I would sing it. It's all in me. It is. Maybe I just wanted you to say it. She also has a number of other names, including Gef, Horn, Mardol, Skalf, Sir, Trung, Trungva, Valfregie, and Vanadis. Oof. You're right. You need a, you need your inhaler. I I might. So I, I kind of feel like she is an amalgam, perhaps, of, you know, maybe earlier on in Norse tradition, there was more of a, a divided, more tribal experience, and each small group had its own myth and had its its predominant female figure. And then when they came together, they all got rolled together. Right. Into a woman composite. Yeah. She is a member of the Vanir, yes. which is uh, the race of gods responsible for wealth, fertility, and commerce, and they are subordinate to the Aesir, who are the warlike gods. Really interesting. Yeah, this kind of web of who does what and, and how, what they represent is really pretty cool. Really pretty cool. I'm, I'm starting to be really more interested in this mythology. I might have to give the Neil Gaiman Norse mythology a gander. Yeah. She's connected to the, to the Valkyries. Mm. Oh, and in fact, she has... So the Valkyries are the, are the figures who come and collect the dead from the battlefield. They choose the slain and bring them to... Valhalla. Valhalla. However, half of those people go to Valhalla. The other half go to Sesrumin, Sesrumnir, Sesrumnir, which is Freya's Hall. Hmm. It's a little quieter. The music is, is nice and sweet. 
less rambunctious. Yeah. It's like a little coffee shop. It's, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's more of the folk rock club and less of the super bass pumping nightclub. Yes, that feels right. Yeah. She is the inspiration for the name Friday. Freya's day. Yes, indeed. Yep, 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 yep. As we will address in the song, she is she rides a chariot pulled by two cats. She's Meow. accompanied by a boar named Hildisvini, and she possesses a cloak of falcon feathers. Apparently, she assists other deities by allowing them to use her feathered cloak. Not quite sure yes. the magic powers behind that. I can tell you. So there are a number yes, of points. There's a, one of the fundamental stories that involves the feathered cloak. And it is fascinating. I wonder what parts of the tradition were missing because it does seem like, mm. you know, with Greek mythology, you have the Odyssey, you have the Iliad. That tells us a lot about the gods. You have, from the Roman period, you have the metamorphoses of Ovid. And that expands our knowledge of that universe as well. Here, we really just have the poetic Eda and the prose Eda, and that's kind of it. Yeah. And so I wonder what were the other stories? Maybe that cloak featured more prominently in stories about Freya. But the one that survives is one of the bad groups of beings, you know, one of the one of the snow giants or something, comes and captures a goddess. And it was kind of Loki's fault because he orchestrated the whole thing. And then Loki says, my bad, that was messed up of me. I tell you what, I'll get her back. Freya, can I borrow your cloak? And she says, yes, but you have to not. And he puts on the cloak, and it apparently gives you the ability to to become like a falcon. Hmm, okay. It is a kind of shamanic, like putting on the skin of an animal to become that animal. That's something that we see a lot in Native American stories. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that gives him the ability to go, and in falcon form, he repossesses the goddess and brings her back to the Vanir. Hmm. One last note is Freya is often sought out by the Jotnar, who are the giants who want to make her their wife. Yes, she is the town hottie, and she's also associated with light and brightness. Yeah. So, diving into Ian's lyrics, if we start with the white section, which is the traditional, the direct from tradition lyrics. Yep, first three verses. Feathered consort, woven fronds maternal, silken shining, light the day, with her whispered promises of passion, fertile joining fashioned clay. Feathered concert, woven fronds maternal, silken shining light the day. With her whispered promises of passion, fertile joining fashioned clay. I feel like I'm, I feel like, I, I like I'm a tennis champion and I'm just like, trying to volley all these metaphors that are being thrown at me. Yeah, it's very, it's very beat poetry almost. Just kind of half thought, half thought, half thought, slight description, adjective. Yeah. There's nothing really to even unpack there. It's really just descriptive of her. Yes. Yeah. Like distant Venus, so seductive, smoothing her scent on boys and men to make them whole and leave them smiling. Thinking of her now and then. My distant Venus, how seductive, smoothing her sins on boys and men to make them whole and leave them smiling. Thinking of her now and then. I'm almost getting the sense of like a sexual rite of passage. You know what I mean? In order to become a man, you have to. Make love to a woman. You know, that's a common conception in, in a lot of traditional cultures. Yeah. She is fertility. You know, she is the goddess is. of fertility. There are some traditions in which a bride on her wedding night or a groom on his wedding day, or even in a ceremonial sexual experience that, that happens in some cultures, some of the participants will take on the identity of a divine being. Mm. And so I don't know if there's any historical, you know, basis for this, but it would be super right. hot to imagine like 
Okay, oh, you're going to lose your virginity? Cool, I will make myself into uh, an earthly representation of the goddess Freya so that you're not only losing your virginity, yeah. you are losing it to a goddess and all the blessings that come there therewith. What better sacrifice there than that? And what better job for me to take on if I ever find myself in ancient Norse culture? Yeah, yeah. You could be Freya. The virginity slayer. <laughs> Let ching, me ching. get my feathered boa. Yeah, not. I mean, Venus is the Roman version of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Love, fertility, again, a lot of the yep. same thing there, feels like. Final verse of the history, like really just the descriptive. They raise her up to sit at heaven's portal to suckle babes, ripen anew, while second self, the sultry Freya, rides behind her cats, gray and blue. They raise her up to sit at heaven's portal to suckle babes, ripen anew, while second self, the sultry Freya, rides behind her cats, gray and blue. So that's interesting. There is a sense of her multiple roles. There's a mm -hmm. sense of her being a sexual figure and also a maternal figure. Yeah. That's quite cool. In a lot of mythologies, that is divided into distinct beings. Right. And I do get the sense that there was an amalgamization of goddesses into one figure. And maybe there was one that was more of the sexual energy being and one that was more of the maternal energy being. Not that mothers can't be sexy. They can. I'm married to one. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I stonewalled your uh, your thought process there. No, no, no. I just, I just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to support your feelings without saying anything disrespectful about your wife, <laughs> one way or another. You think about that while I let the cat out of the office. Okay. <laughs> you think about what you've done. <laughs> Oh. Let the cat out of the office is, in fact, a euphemism. And a nice tie-in with Freya's cats. Exactly. Gray and blue. And he was a gray one. It was one of the gray ones. Yeah, nothing nothing really more on that. I mean, why not have cats pulling your, your chariot, huh? If anything, it is evidence that cats were present in that part of the world in yeah. ancient times. That's pretty cool. Are we thinking like, giant versions of domesticated house cats or are we thinking like panthers you know i was thinking regular sized house cats oh. <laughs> <laughs> just 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 too regular <laughs> well magical house cats of course but you know of that size there is something called the norwegian forest cat if you get a chance you should look up what it looks like because it is adorable and should not be living out there on its own. It looks like it needs snuggles. I'm sure it would <laughs> absolutely tear my hand off of my body. Oh, it is beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful, but very pissy looking cat. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it's two of those. <laughs> okay, I could see that. I thought of like like house cats, but up to like horse size. That makes sense. That makes sense. There's also... A connection, you know, we've talked before about Ian using feline energy in his songwriting as kind of a cue for feminine sensuality. Mm, that's true. And it's interesting that we've gotten all the way up to here, and now there is this ancient historical precedent for that, that Freya, who is this sexy, sensual being, is associated with cats. This was 70 years in the making. Like, he, he planned out the long game to get this song. <laughs> this song is a punchline that has been worked on for a <laughs> long, long time. The setup. Oof. Yeah. Wow. So then we move into the pink section. Wicked diva, cool mug magnet. The sulky, saucy, temptress lights another lip-stained cigarette and turns her face to show the whites of eyes like torches piercing steely. Then gray smoke, a coiling plume, Paris showgirl, headdress cast aside in tawdry dressing room. Wicked diva, cool mug magnet, the sulky saucy tendress lights, another lip stain cigarette, and turns her face to 
That's all one sentence. Yeah, it is. It's the modern day equivalent of Freya, right? I mean, just like the sexy woman. Yeah, and there's something, I find it fascinating that he ties this image up with this idea of a showgirl casting her headdress, going from the feathered cloak of Freya Mm -hmm. to a, a feathered costume piece that can be removed. Right. That almost, he's setting up the goddess and then showing how in modern times someone can put on that persona for their own usage and then take it mm-hmm. off. That's really interesting. Yeah. And it's also, it's it's right behind that, the last of the historical references, he talks about those two sides of Freya. It's the two sides of woman now, I think. You know, maybe she she's this sexy being and then she takes off her headdress and goes home to her kids. Mm. So she is that sexy and then the maternal. Interesting. Yeah. I was thinking of it more from a point of view of femininity as performance. That works too. Yeah. That ultimately gender is a performance and that this is, you know, this could be the Paris showgirl could be a drag queen for all we know. Right. Yeah. Someone is, is taking on this role. Right. And I wonder, and that also seems to be like the goddess herself takes on whatever role is needed at the time. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that interestingly ties back to what you were saying in general of like, is Ian is Ian embodying this story, this character, each individual step of the way? Is he on a broader scale here, just portraying the story itself? He has embodied characters. He has stepped into yes. the shoes of many a character. Oh, yes. And I don't know that we've really seen that so far with this album. Definitely don't think so. Yeah. What you were saying about, you know, anyone has the power to access this Freya energy. Mm -hmm. Or if we say the two sides of woman, you know, of course, women have as many sides as there are women times infinity because every woman has infinite sides to her, like a diamond that never stops getting faces cut in it. A Mobius diamond. A Mobius diamond, a non-Euclidean diamond. (laughs) Yeah, there we go. But it actually reminds me of a line from the play that I'm in right now, from Measure for Measure, where the central character is a woman who is literally entering a nunnery. She is a novice Mm. and she's about to undergo the next phase of becoming like the next step up in nunhood where she can't even speak to men. And her brother is arrested and sends this rascally, handsome figure to go and talk to his sister to try to get her to plead to the authorities on his behalf. Mm -hmm. The rascally figure is me. And so Lucio goes to Isabella and says, hey, your brother's in prison. They're going to kill him because they're being really, they're really following the law very strictly. All hope is gone unless you have the power by your fair grace to soften Angelo. And she's like, what could I possibly do? And Lucio says, assay the power that you have. She's like, what power do I have? (laughs) And he's like, (laughs) and he has this beautiful line where he says, um, go to Lord Angelo and let and let him learn to know when women sue, men give like gods. So it's this idea of like, look, if you, you know, you're a woman, go do the woman thing, tap into that energy, right? take on that goddess power and you'll get everything that you want. And she doesn't get it yet. Yeah. But it's, it's an interesting observation that Shakespeare is making about, you know, the potential in every person to take on that kind of divine energy. Yeah. And shake their butts. Shake that booty. And I think in general, I think it's, you said gender is a performance or whatever. Like, I think this, yeah. this, these two sides, these embodiments of, of Freya could be anybody, any gender or non-gender. Or, there, there is a sexual side and a compassionate side. And a warlike side. 
Yeah, right, right. The three genders. Sexy, daddy, and beat you up. Sexy daddy army. Sexy daddy army. Those those are your options. That's it. Pick one. What is that? Mary, Mary fuck kill. Sexy daddy army. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think I think we just figured out why it's called the feathered consort and not Freya who named it Friday or all the other yeah. things that we could talk about with her. Freya of the shiny torque or Freya cat rider or whatever. The feather the feathered cloak is that I'm gonna put this thing on to become mm-hmm. this person. Yeah. But I can, e- I can as easily take it off. The fact that she has that feathered cape is really works perfectly in this allegory. Like he takes that yeah. and fits it in really nicely. And when you say torque, when you say torque, you're saying T-O-R-C, right? Like the- I think I'm saying T-O-U-R-Q, which is like a bracelet or a necklace. Oh. That's pretty much this shape, but it usually has the kind of baubles on the end. Mm-hmm. It's a traditional Celtic Northern. Sometimes people would wear them on their necks. Yep. You can wear them on your arm. Yeah, we are talking about the exact same thing. I just looked it up. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Very, Very good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. So shiny torque, feathered cloak. Yeah. Cat wagon. Cat wagon. <laughs> get on the cat wagon. I'm going to think about this next time, you know, next morning when I get up and I clothe myself in my man skin, I will think about, you know, what is the role that I'm putting on. I think about the man I killed to put on, <laughs> to get this skin. <laughs> it's so smooth though, it's so smooth. Well, you're not allowed to get boy skins anymore. <sighs> the hippies, hippies put a stop to that. The government wants to take everything from us. Our pate, our boy skins, <laughs> everything fun. Our avocado toast, yeah. Nick, anything else to say about the feathered con sort? Not a peep. I'm noticing there's not, I'm not getting a whole lot of like, ooh, deep context in these songs, it feels like. It's a very different approach to writing from Ian. I feel like we've never mm-hmm. quite seen this. Yeah. There's still a lot going on, but it, it, it's not, it doesn't require that digging that we've grown accustomed to, you know? Or maybe there's something even deeper that we have not yet discovered. Right, right. And that's entirely likely. But I do think it's a different approach to the actual writing that we've not seen before, which is almost Mm -hmm. more this, he's picked the structure beforehand and is then going through and executing it song by song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keeping in meter, keeping in format. It's interesting. It's interesting. I wonder if in committing to this, this structure, this style, that he somehow hampered himself. I don't know. Even subconsciously, you know? We still have fun time signatures. We still have fun scansion. So there's, there are definitely still elements there. Writing under a constraint can be very freeing sometimes. Maybe he mm. felt like he wanted to explore something different. Maybe... He felt like he was bored with his own writing style and decided, okay, I'm going to give myself this hellaciously difficult task yeah, and then stick with it and is undergoing it as a rigor. That's why it feels so much like a, like a musical gift to the gods in a way, because it's so like late. It's feel, that's interesting. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. This is to boil it down. This is the Lyricon blues. This album is the Lyricon Blues. It's what he's so good at as like picking one thing and like really committing to it and doing it damn well. And then yeah. be like, mm, okay, I did that. Check that off the list. Carry on with the next one. Yeah. Nick, what are we talking about next week? Next week is, I think, the third of the singles, Hammer on Hammer. Was that the third or the second? I think it was the third. Navigators was second. Next week, it's going to be Hammer Time. I will find that sound clip, and I will put it in here. Hammer Time! Until next week, if you 
are a wicked diva and want a cool mug magnet, you can go onto <laughs> our T Public page and get a branded Talk Tall to Me mug to sip your heavenly mead out of. Out of which to suck your heavenly mead. <laughs> you are the babes that we suckle with our talk tollery. Mm. And we want to provide you more life-giving milk from our teats. And you can access that life-giving milk by subscribing to our Patreon. For just $5 a month, you get access to our Discord with other like-minded teat suckers. And then you also get the uh, two additional podcasts, Feckless and Outtake Tell to Me. And if you feel like bumping up to that $15 a month, you get all of that plus the video. You will see my lips moving as I say these words. You will see me smoke another lip-stained cigarette. I don't allow him to so smoke in the studio. Or to soak in the studio. <laughs> If you, like a distant Venus, want to tell us something, instead of telling us about the first time you left your scent on Boys and Men, why don't you tell us about how you first got into Jethro Tull? That would make a good story. Give us your jumpstart, and we would love to read it. Drop us a line at momes at fecklessmomes.com, or you can head right to fecklessmomes.com, and there is a contact us right on that front page. I'll make it easy for you. Until next week, I am the Paris showgirl, Omen Thomas Sade. I am the normal-sized house cat that pulls a chariot, Nick McGill. <laughs> we are ripening anew the feckless mooms. And this show is Distant Venus, so seductive. This is Talk Tall to Me. Ah, uh, hello. Are you Lars? Yes. I'm the new stable boy. Oh, uh, welcome. You must be Gilfi. Gilfi, yeah. I'm Gilfi. Uh, and I was told to look for Lars. Good to meet you. Hadde. And um, I wanted to ask, what about happened to the, to the last stable boy? Because I understand that this position came up very, how you say, shouldn't late. Yeah, yeah, that did happen. We did forget to feed the cats one evening, and um, oh, the cats! Yeah, yeah and yeah. Hans was uh, was the first one to open the doors of the barn, and um, the cats uh, they ate him. Okay, okay. We lay it out. We're be going to be blatantly honest. It's possible. It's a possibility. I appreciate that, and I and I also like the hazard pay. But now, when you say cat, catten, do you mean a hossen? Did I hear you correctly with mine ears? You said catten. Yeah, yeah. It was in okay. the ad. It, it was in the ad on Craigslist. Do you sure? You're, this is the the stable for Freya. Do you not understand? Oh, Freya. Yeah, of course. Yes, I I must have uh, the runes was was smeared on the internet, and so I wasn't quite sure. But wow, how cool! I'm going to tell all my friends at the discotheque later tonight. That I am a stable boy for Freyish cats. Well, you you haven't been hired yet. Uh, let's oh, let's not jump to the interview. I yes, yeah, okay. yeah, of course. I apologize for my too forwardness. I like the initiative, though. I like it. Lars, I want to be your stable boy, and I would like to see what is the first task that you have in store for me today. I have uh, quite a Herculean task for you, you Gilfi. We have a hundred stables that need to be cleaned out. Their litter boxes need to be cleaned. And we need it done today. Oh, my God. It needs to be today. I see on your resume you have cat box experience. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I once cleaned out the cat box of the great, the great Saharan lion. That is very impressive. Do you is is that on your contacts? I didn't see yes, that on your contacts. Yes, your, yes, yes. Oh, okay. You can call the Sahara, but the phone lines is very bad. Uh, you could also. I was uh, a stand-in yeah, yeah. for the uh, for the cat wrangler of Siegfried and Roy. Oh, was this before or after? No, the not morning? that week. Not oh, that week. Oh, okay, I was not okay. there that week. That was somebody Good. else. Good. So yes, good. you can check. You can check my dates. 
Good, you, you have an alibi. Now, why did you leave yeah. Siegfried and Roy? Well, you know, the Wanderlust uh, gets into a young man, and I yeah, had a yeah. passion for, for feeling my wild oats. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, we are looking for someone for a permanent position, so I, I don't want someone who is going to just take off like a, like a fairy sprite and flutter away on the wind. I'm looking for someone to commit to these cats. Commit to the cats. Lush, when you think of steadfastness, I want you to think of Gilfie. I have taken the last seven years to show all my wild oats and they are growing. Some of them are not growing and I have decided I want to commit one or two cats. That is it. That's all I have the bandwidth for. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Are you a cat owner yourself, Gilfi? No, I am allergic. So I am hoping that Freya's cats are hypoallergenic. They are touched by the deity, so I, I believe you, you should ah, be okay. Ah, yeah, how wonderful. Yeah. Yes, otherwise I will have to take quite a lot of anti schniffen pillen. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So there's a lot of a lot of time in this job where you uh, you will be working alone in in the stables. No. Is okay, uh, yeah. are you okay working on your own? You could listen to music on your phone. Is that something you you would be comfortable with? Oh, yes. I have found in my previous work with the felines that uh, a lot of felines prefer to have a little music playing during mm. the day. Otherwise, they get lonesome and they start clawing at the, at the enclosures. Yeah, and so I, yeah. have a, I have a good selection. Uh, I can show you here. I have brought my records with me. I did not request that, but that's, uh, that, that's foresight. I like that. Yes, I have foresight. Here we have um, Richard Wagner, a good composure, perhaps an insane person. And of course, we have Beethoven. A lot of the kitties like the Beethoven. Yeah, yeah, they are fans of classical. Yeah. Yes, this one is for when they have a little catnap, I put on the bark. And just for regular times, I have a wonderful podcast. Oh, it is so lovely. It is a podcast made by two young men's who must have been touched by the deity of poetry themselves. Their tongues are like silver. The cats do like to hear the conversation. It makes them feel like they are included and there's someone around. I will play for them on the first day. Doc, tell to me. Mein Gott. I did not know they put out records of that, but uh, that, that is very exciting. Let me show you. <sighs> Cocktail to me is a proud member of the Feckless Moles Audio Network. Oh, zoot, I forgot to rewind it. <laughs> 